the uh, air source heat pumps, which you're going to be talking about in a minute, one of the most important things is in, if you're retrofitting, you always need to make sure that your house is well insulated. We're talking about loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, which we can see here. If you can't do cavity wall like I have in my house, my house built in 1901 has solid nine inch walls. You then have two options where you can either clad the outside of the property with say polystyrene sheets and then render, but then you can come inside and actually clad the inside of the building. It's very, very important that you must actually get the insulation right for these systems to work most effective. Now, we've got two depths of insulation here. Why is that? Explain well, that a bit to me. Well, it's new regulations. The more insulation you have on the right-hand side, the more heat you're going to retain, so therefore the less work that the actual heat pump is going to actually need to do to keep the house warm. Right, OK. Now, look, so it's just a simple case then of chucking the boiler off the wall and throwing up a pump, isn't it? Not quite. I mean, the boiler Look, you're moving is. at the moment... Look, it is. I can show moment, you. There it is. The boiler okay. that you're moving <laughs> at the moment is currently about 90% efficient. Now, with uh, retrofitting properties to degree, that, that's quite good. When we talk about the heat pumps, which are behind my privy garden bush, these units can come in at about 300%, 400% efficient. But it does depend on atmospheric temperature. The how cold is it outside, so to speak, or what is the temperature outside, and so therefore what can these actually produce? And what bits are different to the boiler install exactly? You know? Well, this particular unit we have on the left is no different as far as a plumber is concerned. Although the unit works on refrigeration technology, like your fridge in your kitchen, uh, if you can all imagine going home and looking at your fridge, you load the fridge up with your various food, bottle of wine, tin of beer. We know if we turn a fridge round 180, there's an element at the back of the fridge that gets hot. So in crudity, this is what we're talking about with air to water heat pumps. Turn your fridge round and you've now produced some sort of heat. You can't get your beer out, unfortunately, anymore, but that's a Actually, it's a quite downside. nice having this on the stand. It is nice. I'm going to swap places in a minute. Now, look, it doesn't stand like a, it look like a, a standard water boiler, is it? Right? This is an unvented hot water cylinder, which we coupled in. You can actually use these units to produce hot water, but the greater the temperature that you want to draw from atmospheric temperature, what we call the COP, i.e. the efficiency, will obviously fall down. Realistically, what we're looking at these is ideally suited to underfloor heating, where underfloor heating, the temperatures are a lot lower requirements compared to, say, normal radiator system. So retrofitting, just banging this or plumping this onto an existing system, need a lot of planning involved with regards to working out how big is your radiator, what is the heat output of these radiators, and so forth. How simple is the installation? The installation is very simple. It's only plumbing techniques. I say refrigeration. That is what they call a hermetically sealed unit. So you don't actually have to have an F-gas qualification to install this unit. It's purely plumbing that is required. Brilliant. OK, that's great. Thank you. So is there anything else? I mean, the, what are the, benefit, the key benefits as far as you're concerned of a system It's the like energy this? efficiency. They, they suggest that it takes three kilowatts of uh, power in a power station to provide one kilowatt of electricity. If I now put that one kilowatt of power into that unit, I'll technically get between three to four kilowatts back out as usable heat. So we're talking about efficiency. We, we in the UK have very little natural resources. The coals, the oils, and the gases are running out. Those are items that you can't quickly replace. They were formed over millions of years ago. In my crude logic, if the sun comes up every morning, you can actually pull the temperature from atmosphere uh, and then use it. And apparently they say there's about 10, year, 10 million years or billion years left in the sun. So oh, is there? you should see we're us We're safe out. then. Yeah, we're OK. Um, when it comes to the commissioning of this, though, I mean, one thing, just going back a step, what's the important thing you're looking for? In fact, more important, looking to eradicate. There's a lot of things. The main thing is with regards to the air in the heat pump and the circulation. We've got this looped into an underfloor heating system here, which Martin will be jumping in later. But if we can get all the air out of the system, we fill the system in principle with glycol, which is an antifreeze, similar to what you'd have in your car cooling system. Um, because there's two pipes external onto the building, we actually want to protect it against freezing. We circulate the glycol through the central heating system, get the air out, and it, it works great. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you for that. No Hang worries. around because we might have no some worries. questions. Where's Martin? Martin, come and join us from Open On. Now, how do you retrofit underfloor heating? It's, it's not really, David. Uh, retrofitting is probably a very small part of the underfloor application. Most people are installing in a new build installation. Right. Um, and underfloor is generally pipe work within the floor construction, emitting heat into that floor and, and raising the air temperature. Now, one of the key things is insulation, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've heard it. Stefan's mentioned it. Many people have mentioned it today. Insulation is critical, both in the walls, in the floors, and in the ceiling, yes. Um, 
when it comes to underfloor heating, there are two things you must control. Number one is the water temperature flowing through the, your circuit. And an underfloor will work with a, a gas boiler, oil boiler, or biomass, but also it marries, for me, perfectly with, with air source heat pumps, generally because the heat pump is the water temperature control for you. Now, just one thing about the floor finishes. Are any floor finishes better than others or worse than others? Yeah, there is, David. If I just take that back a bit, yeah. it's floor construction is, is quite critical as well. So right. if you can bury the pipes in a concrete screeded floor, then you'll find that, those, that the floor will perform for you better. There's two ways of, of heating floor constructions. You either heat a thermal mass, which is typically a concrete screeded floor, or you'll heat an airspace or a plated system. So, yeah, floor construction, but the general rule is screeded floor is the best. Right. No doubt. Right. Now, this is the sort of typical type of underfloor heating we expect to see, sort of the old worming of the, the yep. pipes with uh, some clips and so on. But it, you've got something new. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Well, as you said, uh, on the floor here is what they commonly call the meander pattern. And the it's, meander uh, pattern. Meander pattern going up and down and dissipating the heat into the floor. It's quite critical below at the pipe spacings when the installer installs it. Um, and this is a staple effect where a pipe is fitted directly to insulation. It's the most common way they, they continue to do that, really, domestically and commercially. But there's a new system being launched in Germany a few years ago that Upanor now have started to bring into the UK. It's and called... It looks like Velcro. It is a little bit like Velcro, yeah. It's a different type of insulation that you'll lay down on top of the floor construction. And then the pipe work is actually laid and fitted directly to the insulation. And you're very true. It's very much like Velcro. Um, the stapling effect is always a two-person fix, one person rolling the pipe, the second person stapling the pipe to the insulation. But the Velcro method is a one-person application. And, and does it move? No, it doesn't, if I honestly. As you walk the pipe into place, and there are some demonstrations on the uh, other plumb center stand, but as you walk the pipe into place, it actually steps it on and, and adheres it to the insulation. Of course, to say, if there's any information you want from here, you can either get the information at the Plum Centre stand, or if you see one of the people, not me, because I haven't got one, in a blue T-shirt, they've got scanners, they'll scan your passes and they'll send you the information from the relevant presentation or display and so on. I mean, the key benefits here, clearly. Absolutely. Uh, low water temperatures, yeah. an invisible heat source, a silent running heat source are the, f are the main features. And a well-spread. Uh, yeah, no cold spots, yeah. Right. The other thing that people must adhere to is they need to look at air temperature control in different rooms. So we do that with either a range of wireless or hardwired thermostats. Brilliant. Okay. Okay. Now, hang around. Does anybody have any questions they'd like?